Hello and welcome to the recorded lesson over nationalism and sectionalism. In this lesson we're going to be focusing on how the country is brought together um, in a sense of national unity after the War of 1812, but then also over the years um, specific sections of the country do start to form with different interests that uh, they want to focus on for themselves. The War of 1812 increased American nationalism. The idea of nationalism means a feeling of pride, loyalty, and protectiveness toward your nation. During this time, uh, people start to, instead of thinking of themselves as from a state, so instead of you saying, you know, I'm from New York or Virginia, so I'm a New Yorker or I am a Virginian, I instead, we start focusing more on we are Americans, um, that the, the United States is a nation of, of all people instead of just individual states. This is mainly due to um, the fact that we win the War of 1812. People start coming together in that sense uh, to kind of claim the United States as their nation instead of just uh, as a state. President James Madison at the time wanted to strengthen the nation and unify these regions. Madison wanted to uh, get America to succeed without the use of foreign products, meaning he did not want us to rely on things that are made in other countries. He wanted us to uh, be making those things ourselves. He presented a plan along with Henry Clay to make the American economy self-sufficient. That word self-sufficient means that um, you do things, you do things yourself, you are um, doing things and creating things all by yourself. So we talked about plantations being self-sufficient. If you were self-sufficient, it means that you come up with all your food on your own, all your clothing on your own. What James Madison wants is for us to be self-sufficient as Americans, as a nation. He does not want us to have to go and buy things from other nations. The system that he wants to put into place and Henry Clay want to push it, put into place is the American system. This system has three main parts. One is that it's going to set up a protective tariff. A tariff is a tax on foreign goods. Um, the goal of a tariff is to eliminate competition from foreign uh, companies. So the idea is that if you have a box of goods, let's say it's cereal, and it's made by, made by an American company, and you also have a box of goods, and it's made by a British company, each box is the exact, exact same, each cereal tastes the same, it's the same amount, it's all that, um, and the company is going to sell it for $5 each. Um, with a tariff, the goal is to make this British product more expensive. So the tariff is put on it. Um, let's say it's a $2 tariff. So you add $2, it's now going to cost $7. So now when you have these two products side by side on the shelf, you, it's no longer $5, it's 7 which means that people are generally going to spend $5 on the same box of cereal as opposed to $7. So now this American company that is selling this cereal is now going to get more sales, make more money, and grow larger while this British company is not going to sell as much and not become as um, wealthy because it is now more expensive for people to buy it. Um, this is called a protective tariff. It's trying to set up uh, people to buy more things from American companies to grow the American economy at this time. The second thing is to establish a national bank which promote a single currency. Um, before this plan, you would have two states and one state like Missouri would have like Missouri bucks and then in the in Illinois, you would have Illinois bucks. Well, Missouri bucks and Illinois bucks might not equal the same thing. So one Missouri buck might be two Illinois bucks. So that means that it's going to be very difficult to go back and forth between the states, to do trade, to do business amongst each other. So what James Madison wants to do is instead have one single currency. So you're going to have the dollar bill. So everybody in Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, everywhere, they're going to be using the dollar bill instead of all of these different kinds of things. That means that people can trade more efficiently between the states. You know, if you're in Missouri, you can go to Illinois 
you can do business with them. You don't have to worry about your money not being worth anything over there. And then the last thing is they want to improve the country's transportation. So they want to make roads, canals, build more railroads to make it easier to go from place to place and connect with people, do business, do trade, bring everybody closer together. This leads to what we call the era of good feeling. This uh, increased nationalism, people start caring less about individual states and more about the betterment of the whole country. James Monroe, a Democratic Republican, wins the election of 1816 by a landslide. The Federalist Party um, run against James Monroe, but they put up very little fight and soon that party actually disappears. Political tensions fade away because there's really only one dominant party that everyone is supportive of, and that's the Democratic Republicans, and this leads to an era of good feeling. So if you're not fighting back and forth all the time in, within political parties, uh, you get a lot accomplished. And if the people of the country are supportive of that one um, political party, things are going. a lot of things are going to get done. During this time, several landmark Supreme Court cases uh, also promote national unity by strengthening the federal government. Um, national unity is strengthened by the federal government because if the federal government can decide laws and control things throughout the entire country, more people can um, do those things. McCulloch versus Maryland is one of those. In this Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court ruled that a state could not tax a national bank. This makes the federal government more powerful, and it gets people to use that one currency, that, um, that dollar bill, instead of the state's money that they are trying to use. Um, some banks in Maryland are still trying to use their state currency and actually putting a tax on the national currency, which that means that if you're using the dollar bill instead of the Maryland buck, you're going to end up paying more. Um, the Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to allow the national currency to be accepted. The Supreme Court said that if a state could do this, it would basically give the state more power over the federal government, which is not allowed under the Constitution. So it's unconstitutional to tax the currency. Transportation begins to link these cities. We talked about this a little bit in the Industrial Revolution and Transportation Revolution. In 1806, Congress funds the National Road. The National Road is going to stretch from the East Coast to the Midwest in uh, Illinois, almost all the way to St. Louis. By 1841, this road was the main East to West route, and it stretched from Maryland all the way to Illinois. This is going to allow people who are living in all of these parts of the country to communicate, to trade, and to uh, work with one another. Instead of kind of only being able to get things from maybe here to here, um, in a short amount of time, now you have a reliable road that you could get your goods from the middle of Ohio all the way to Maryland or from the middle of Ohio all the way to Illinois and still be able to make money and do business. Water transportation also improved. Erie Canal, uh, which connects Buffalo or connects New York um, to Buffalo, uh, the Erie Canal allowed farm products to go from the Midwest. So if you look at this uh, map here, these farm products could go up from Wisconsin or, or Illinois or Indiana, they would all be able to go here or any of the other ports. Then you would be able to travel through the Great Lakes and get through um, the Erie Canal all the way to the East Coast and into the Atlantic Ocean. You can then also, these people on the East Coast can send manufactured goods all the way back this way as well. So again, it makes things smaller. It allows for it allows for quicker travel, easier transportation of good, more business to be done. Railroads also improved during this time. In between 1830 and 1850, just a mere 20 years, the amount of railroad tracks go from 23 miles, just 23 simple miles of railroad tracks in 1830, to 9,000 miles of railroad tracks by 1850. Um, so that is quite the increase and they are going to zigzag all over the country allowing for faster travel, faster communication, um, a better sense of togetherness. This growth in nationalism does not come without its problems. Sectionalism also starts to increase. Sectionalism is loyalty to the interests of a region or section of the country. 
So the people in the south want what's best for the people in the south. The people in the north wants what wants what's best for the people in the north. People in the west, same thing. Um, the south, all of these differences basically center around economic differences or money. The south relies on slavery. They want slavery to remain legal in the United States. They also want land in the West to be cheap so they can then move out there and set up farms with slave labor and make a whole bunch of money. The North relies on manufacturing, factories, and labor. They want slavery to go away because they're in factories paying people to work in factories while the South is just getting free labor from slaves. They want land in the West to be expensive because they don't want all of their immigrants who are in the North who are working in the factories to go West and then if they all go West then they don't have any more people to work in those factories. So the South wants slavery, wants cheap land in the West. The North wants no slavery, wants expensive land in the West. The settlers in the West want cheap land. They don't want slavery, um, or they want to be able to s decide on their own. This, All of these things, all of these three things, come to kind of a big boiling point when Missouri applies for statehood. Before Missouri is a state, there are 11 slave states and 11 free states. The people in Missouri wanted to be a slave state. This would upset the balance between slavery and free. So you're going to have 12 to 11 instead of 11 to 11. If it's 11 to 11, it means that if uh, slave states want to you know, expand slavery, the free states can vote them out and basically it's a tie and nothing can go forward. However, if it's 12 to 11, then the slave states have an advantage, and that's not what people want. So, Missouri still wants to become a state, but they can't really solve this problem unless they can find some sort of compromise or balance. People in Congress argued about Missouri. Southerners said Congress should not ban slavery in a state, um, and Missouri should be able to choose. At this time, Maine also wants to apply for statehood. They want to be a, a free state. Henry Clay, um, back to his ideas from the American system, he is popping up here again. Henry Clay suggests what is going to be known as the Missouri Compromise. This says Maine can be a free state, Missouri can be a slave state, and that then goes back to 12 and 12, so it's going to be equal in Congress again. The Compromise also states that slavery would be banned... Um, north of the 36th parallel. If parallel is like a line on the globe, a longitude and latitude line. So the parallel is this line right here. Hopefully you can kind of see that. It's kind of in red. It's the southern border of, the, of Missouri. Um, so they say anything above this is going to be free. Anything below this is going to be slave. Um, besides Missouri, as you can see, it's clearly above that line. This settles things for now, but tensions over slavery are rising, divisions form, um, and then this line, the 36th parallel, all the way through the Mason-Dixon line, basically cut the country in half between free and slave, and um, these sectional differences grow and grow and mount and mount and um, never really are resolved until you fast forward until we get to the Civil War. National boundaries um, also help nationalist and nationalism feelings. We have to figure out, you know, where does our country start? Where does it end? How do we stand on the world stage? Um, the Rush Bagot Agreement is a one of the agreements between the United States and Britain. It limited the amount of naval forces each country could have in the Great Lakes. The Convention of 1818 also settles our northern border between British Canada um, and ourselves as the 49th parallel. Um, at the moment right now, the Oregon country is still not settled, but at 1818, it gives us the 49th parallel up here, um, and then eventually we will settle the Oregon country, but right now it is jointly occupied. So it, the Convention of 1818 and the Rush Bagot Agreement settle tensions with Britain. With Spain, um, they aren't as easy to figure out. We are arguing with them over Florida. Um, we have problems because the Spanish are not there policing Florida, meaning pirates, slaves, Native Americans can all kind of have a base in Florida, and then they go 
out and attack us in our southern states. The United States basically tells Spain, you either need to get your stuff under control in Florida or give it to us so we can get our so we can get it under control. Spain eventually does give us the land along with their claim to the Oregon Territory. So now in the Oregon Territory, it's just the British and the U.S. Um, they do this in the Adams-Onis Treaty of 1819. Adams-Onis Treaty, Convention of 1818, and the Rush-Bagot Agreement are all of these things that help establish our um, establish our nation's boundaries. Next thing that kind of puts us on the world stage is the Monroe Doctrine. Throughout the Americas, other countries were taking control of lands and colonizing the areas around us, which kind of start to threaten the United States. In December of 1832, President Monroe issued a statement saying that the Americas, uh, North and South America, are closed to colonization and that further attempts would be stopped by the United States. This becomes known as the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine is important because it really shows that we see ourselves as a world power now. Um, we also see ourselves as kind of the protectors of Latin American countries that had at once been colonies, uh, but then had broken away for themselves. And we want to protect them and allow them to be free nations and not have to worry about Spain or Britain coming over and colonizing them. We step up on the world stage and say, hey, we are going we are going to be controlling this area. We are going to be protecting this area. We will not be allowing you to just come and stomp all over this area. The Monroe Doctrine, um, you know, is important part of America's, um, you know, world presence through the rest of the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Um, even to this day, uh, but it puts us out there in the world. We're not, you know, we're not seeing ourselves as a smaller nation any longer. We are um, seeing ourselves as a large nation that is on the world stage, and that that ties into this idea of nationalism, having pride in our country. Um, but nationalism really isn't the only part of the story here. Sectionalism starts to pop up and will not be solved until we see uh, collisions in the Civil War. So that's the lesson over nationalism and sectionalism.